Uh, welcome to the September 27, 2007 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, George, you want to lead right us? Right here. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. The first... Item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? <coughs> so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Item on consent. Does anybody wish to pull it? Seeing none, I'll read it into the record. Uh, Planet Pet. Request for administrative permit use approved. Approval for a veterinary clinic in a commercial plaza. Dr. Melissa Mueller, owner. Uh, Milton Construction, Inc. agent, located at 2190 45th Street, zoning classification CG, general commercial land use designation, CI commercial industrial. Uh, <coughs> do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Who, who was that? Sorry. No, that was Sorry, George. Me. Uh, Seconded. Greg. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Passage unanimously. Items not on consent, and this is being brought back from our last meeting. Sandridge on the Green, reconsidered from September 13, 2007 meeting. Request for preliminary plat approval of a 58-lot conventional single-family subdivision to be known as Sandridge on the Green. EDC, Inc., owner, W.F. McCain and Associates agent, located at 5010 69th Street, zoning classification RS6, single-family residential up to six units per acre, land use designation L2, low-density residential up to six units per acre, and the density on the overall project is 2.96 units per acre. And we have a couple of quasi-judicial items, so anybody that wishes to uh, speak on the matter needs to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Uh, who's doing this? Sorry, I'm... Steve. Round two. <laughs> if you want to abbreviate this presentation and just go right to the... Chase, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bruce. Uh, my name is Stephen Deardorff with Indian River County Community Development Department. Uh, as you stated, this is Sandridge on the Green. I'll go to the landscape design first. Uh, there's a proposed 15-foot uh, all-native vegetation uh, buffer on the east, west, and north sides. And on 69th Street, there's a type B buffer with a 6-foot opaque feature. Upland preservation tracks, there's two of them, one located in the northwest corner and one in the southwest corner. These are both required because the site has 7.7 .7 acres of uh, upland. Uh, here's an um, aerial of the site showing, showing what the, uh, the vegetation, and you can see on the uh, west half of the site is predominantly uh, wooded. There are some, they're predominantly, I'm sorry, slash pines, and there are some hardwoods in the area. The right side of the, or the east side of the site was a former grove. The area that I've highlighted there on the screen is the uh, area that contains the hardwoods and palms. The trees you see dotted with red dots are all oak trees. There are six of them and they are proposed to be moved or saved in their current locations. Uh, the trees that uh, may require mitigation I have marked with X's. These trees are uh, either very large or not healthy at all. As far as the, the traffic concerns that were in the last presentation, um, staff has corrected that. And the, the uh, last presentation, you had a 
old traffic study and was inadvertently inserted into the traffic study. And the new traffic study has been added. Um, <coughs> is there any questions? Thank you. Any questions of staff? No, I appreciate the tree survey. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, normally on items not on consent, we ask if anybody from the public wishes to speak. Does anybody wish to speak? Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Chris Pontello, WF McCain and Associates, 1171 19th Street, Vero Beach. Um, we're the engineers for the project. I'm here on behalf of the applicant and i um, like to answer any questions that you might have. If you need any further explanation of the vegetation, I, I did go out and uh, walk the site again. Uh, that western half of the site was actually part of the grove. Uh, the citrus trees out there are either dead or dying, and um, some other vegetation has come up. Uh, like Steve said, there's some slash pines. There's oaks around the existing residence that he's pointed out to you, and uh, quite a bit of Brazilian pepper that will be removed. And other than that, it's just mostly undergrowth. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion, or does anybody else from the public wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion on this? I move to adopt as presented. I surveyed it this afternoon from the golf course side. <laughs> <laughs> do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Passage unanimously. The tree study was very nice to add in there, though. Next item up is also quasi-judicial. Quasi um, Verizon 68818 at the Moorings. Request for administrative permit use approval to construct a stealth, stealth wireless communications tower at the Moor, Moorings Club. SBA Network Services, Inc. agent located at 100 Harbor Drive, zoning classification RS3, single family residential up to three units per acre. Land use designation L1, low density one, up to three units per acre. And, uh, sorry, Brian, is Brian going to do this? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Bruce. I am Brian Freeman, Indian River County Senior Planner. This is an application by SBA Networks on behalf of Verizon Wireless to construct a 100-foot tall stealth wireless communications facility, and the tower has been designed to have the appearance of a flagpole. The tower has also been designed to accommodate a minimum of three users. That would include Verizon and two additional users, and also the applicant has submitted a te technical justification for the tower, which has been reviewed and accepted by the county's telecommunications manager. This is a uh, view of the zoning map in the area around the tower, and as you can see, this part of the barrier island is all zoned RS3 single-family residential. And this is an aerial view of the tower site and the vicinity and as you can see the site is located right at the northern edge of the moorings which includes a, uh, is a recreational facility that includes a clubhouse, golf course, tennis courts and other recreational uses and also just to the north is the south campus of the St. Edwards School. Be besides those two uses the, this area of the Barrier <coughs> Island is predominantly single-family residential. And this is a closer view of the tower site. As you can see, the tower is going to be located just to the north of what are existing maintenance buildings for the moorings. And to the south and west of the site are moorings tennis courts. And then to the north of the site, are that is property that is part of St. Edward's School. And as you can see, there are some athletic fields in this area. And then to the east of the site is the driving range for the moorings. And then the water body that you see to the, the left edge or the west edge of the, this image is the Indian River Lagoon. This is a view of the site plan for the site and the actual location of the, uh, the flagpole is what is highlighted on this image. And as you can see along the uh, lower edge of this um, plan is the existing maintenance building. 
There are two existing live oak trees in the area that is going to be the uh, compound for the, the uh, tower and its uh, associated equipment. One is an existing live oak, which is to remain, and they will build the tower around this tree. And the second one is an existing oak that is to be relocated. This, this is a view of the landscape plan for the tower. And is it, is it going to be relocated locally on, on site? It's going to be located somewhere in the moorings. I don't think it's going to be located within the it is tower, tower moorings, compound. Yeah. And then as far as the, the new landscaping for the, uh, the area development, there will be some live oak trees, silver buttonwood as understory and viburnum to screen the uh, compound area. The applicant has provided photo simulations from four different um, angles of the proposed tower, and this is the first of those, which is from the north. And this actually, what you see in the foreground are the ball fields for St. Edwards, and as you'll also notice, there are some existing light poles around the ball fields, and those light poles right now are about the tallest structures in the area and are about 70 feet in height. The second view is actually from Highway A1A, and this is looking west from A1A towards the location. And what you see in the foreground of this image is the driving range for the moorings. And as you can see, there's also the uh, poles and the netting for the driving range. So that's another structure that is also of some height in the area of the proposed tower. And this shot here is from the south. I believe this is from Harbor Drive within the moorings looking you know, into the distance to where the tower is to be located. And then the last um, angle, I guess, is the best that they were able to do from the west without getting on a boat. But this is looking uh, from one of the peninsulas in the moorings that, that extends out into the uh, lagoon towards the, or from the southwest towards where the tower location is to be located. Staff has reviewed the application, and based on staff's analysis, um, staff recommends that the Planning and Zoning Commission grant administrative permit use approval with the following condition, and that condition be that the tower be designed to structurally accommodate at least three users, which would be Verizon plus at least two additional users. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. You want to do this dance again for me on uh, what's the height of a structure that requires a light? <coughs> is it over 100 feet or is it? Oh, as far as a uh, wireless communications facility? Yeah. The FAA requires anything over 200 feet to 200 be lighted. Feet. Okay, that yes. was what I was looking for. Thank you. George. And Brian, maybe this is for you or the applicant. I just looking at the pictures, and I, through the years, I remember there's been two or three times in conversation with St. Ed's about using the light um, poles on the, around the football field, and I'm just wondering if Verizon pursued that. It's, it's, it's instead of this tower, I didn't know if, they, if that had happened because that was what kind of the general assumption in the area was going to be. There's going to be a tower, but I, you know, they may as well use what we've got. Yeah, that's actually a good question, and Verizon's been looking at this, trying to locate a tower in this area for a number of years, and at one time I know there was discussions about using a facility that probably – you know, modifying or replacing one of the existing light poles. You know, Verizon and, and the school, I don't think they were able, ever able to work out an agreement on that. And Verizon, you know, then went and, you know, has got this proposal at the, uh, the Moorings Club. You know, if, you know, there, there's obviously multiple telecommunications carriers, and, and I would think most of them probably would have a need to provide some kind of level of coverage on the barrier island in this area so the, the reason I ask is that we do have room they, they're supposed to make space for three people and it's a little scary when we have talked about towers enough to even remember anything but one of the things I remember is that the uh, the, the guy on top has best reception the number two guy has second best reception number three guy is usually third in line this tower is a hundred feet the lights poles I don't know what the light poles 70. were at St. Ed's but they're 70. relatively 70, 70 feet yeah. um, usually in an area like that with three people if they need it you'd go to 110 or 120 or 130 and we don't want to, to, to get a monopole that high and that's why I was wondering about the ability to use some of the structure in that area which would probably give better coverage if you're going to have the additional <coughs> competitors on the on the tower now maybe Verizon isn't interested in that but it was the only, that's the only thing I can see a question here. I mean, there's no the towers, you know, certainly not sticking out like a sore thumb and whatnot. So I, but that was I was just kind of curious where the history of this had had started and ended. 
In, in staff's discussions, you know, we think it's possible in the long term that this particular stealth facility and also a stealth facility at St. Ed's with the lights uh, is a possibility. Um, but in other words, having, having both. In this area, as well as some other areas, we think that the 100-foot range, if you look at photo simulations, uh, can work, we think, visually in this area. Uh, but we wouldn't want to see something on the order of 130, 120. It, would, it really does actually start to get out of scale. So okay. we think it's possible you could wind up with both. Uh, in okay. the, I just wouldn't, with the crossovers and the, 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 re, and the interference, I wasn't sure how that worked. But that was really the main question I had. Brian, what, what is the size of the one at uh, C. Oaks? So, uh, yes, the uh, Chairman Bruce, the tower that was built at C. Oaks earlier this year was 85 feet in height. Five, so this is 15 feet higher. Okay, yeah. 100 is not a okay. very tall tower. Was there any were there any objections from St. Ed's? No, I, I think they are interested in preserving their interest in you know, a potential tower on their site in the future, but there's no objections that they've expressed to us on this okay. particular location. Any other questions? Um, this item also is not on consent. Traditionally, we um, ask uh, the public to comment. Does anybody from the public wish to comment? Um, and have you been sworn in? No. They're from St. Ed's. Hmm? That's from St. Ed's. Okay. Uh, my name is Frank Spitzmiller. I'm the Chief Advancement Officer over at St. Edward's School, and I thought I would just, I wasn't going to say anything, but I thought I'd just address okay, the but issue. Have you been sworn in? I have not. Okay, we need to swear you in. And anybody else, that, hand, anybody else that wishes to speak also? Okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in response to what Mr. Hamner was saying, St. Edward's still is interested in pursuing uh, the possibility of a tower, and we have talked to the county. Unfortunately, uh, we were, uh, and we are still finalizing our funding on it, and I would hope that uh, simply that whatever you do in regard to this application would not preclude the possibility of us using one of our light poles as a a subsequent uh, tower. We are interested in doing it. We have contacted uh, certain of the carriers or uh, suppliers, and uh, uh, we think that it could be viable in both both places. If um, if the requirement of the three, which has been normal, this has been we followed this for now what two to three four years since we've done towers where we require two or three people on a tower. Yeah. Would St. Ed's have to wait for the fourth person, or would they? If they have an interested party and technically they say they can be, it'll, it'll work together. I mean, what is our policy on that? Yeah, basically th there does need to be justification for another carrier coming in, not on the pole that's, that's before you all tonight. And you're correct. Uh, the, obviously, the lower that you go on that, that pole, the, um, the less coverage you can get. So we've you, you've seen a lot of concentric circles. I know that. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> well, what could, what could occur? We, we think it's probably likely that, that two carriers could get some pretty decent coverage with, with the 100 foot height. Uh, I would be surprised if, I would think it would be technically justifiable for another carrier to come in to show that they couldn't uh, go in at say 70 foot height, uh, that they would need to be at a taller structure that they could then do it at St. Ed. So I think we, it would be technically justified is what they'll have to show. That, that's the figure. And, and it depends on, it will depend on their coverage characteristics. I, that was one of the things with the poles that we were talking about way back in the beginning. The higher poles mean less towers, whereas shorter poles mean a lot more, whether it's towers off of lights or whatever. And that was one of the things when visually the trade-off, you get a bunch of people on one tower or you spread them out and they're much shorter. And so the height does become a problem. But I just was curious as to what we would do in light of their question. And this is, again, this is, as Brian was saying, this is a very good area on the South Bear Island for, for really two installations ultimately because it's such, they're both kind of large campus settings. They're not near any residential structures. And so it, visually it fits. Um, it'll, it'll just be technical justification in, in St. Ed's case. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Also, please state your name and address for the record. 
Yes, my name is Jana Loda. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Holland and Knight with offices at 1 East Broad Boulevard, Suite 1300, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. And staff has uh, very aptly gone through the application and the request, so I certainly am not going to belabor any of those facts again. Um, however, uh, we certainly have several individuals here that can answer questions for you if the board is so inclined. We have uh, uh, Mariko Tolman, who is the RF engineer for Verizon Wireless, as well as Jason Lasky with SBA Networks, who was the agent on this application and has processed it through um, the county. So if there's any other questions that either I can answer or them, we are certainly here and available. Thank you. I would like to know what sort of coverage you would get off of a 70-foot tower. What sort of range can you get off of a 70-foot tower? That would be the St. Ed's Tower. Certainly. Just out of curiosity, please. I'll ask Mariko Tolman, who is with Verizon Wireless, to uh, come up and address that question. My name is Mariko Tolman. Um, it depends on the different types of uh, morphologies and um, antenna types that we use, but in this area, the the coverage would be reduced from our 100 foot by um, maybe about a quarter, three tenths of a mile or so. That's quite a bit. It is. So what, what would be the range that you're going to get off the 100-foot tower? I'm looking for a rough order of magnitude, not exact. You know, I'm, are, are you going to reach to the North Beach or are you going to reach? I don't know exactly where the North Beach is, but I believe it's about 1.1 miles, I believe, north. The okay, one, the one to one and a half miles. Not quite one and a half. Okay. Be close to the county line. Yeah, I was going to say it, it covered the county line. There's a blank spot there. I know that from my my is well needed. I'm just I don't see how you're going to get anything on a 70 foot pole. What what carrier would want on a 70 foot pole? So it was for my education. Thank you very much. They add to them. They they go up from there. That's what I understand. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else from the public wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Do you have any questions up here to have a motion? Move to adopt as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, we're approaching the public hearings, and I'm going to turn the chair over to George Hamner. He's obviously more familiar with both of these uh, <laughs> topics I know these than proposals, I am. Right? Great. Thank you. Um, we have two items on public hearings. The first one is uh, consideration of a proposed amendment uh, to the provisions of Title IX land development regulations regarding the prohibition of citrus greening in Caribbean fruit fly host plants. This was requested by the citrus industry due to a new disease that's even more devastating than canker. Um, and that was something that's near and dear to my heart. And, if our attorney might want to go over what he's the research he's done, and then we'll open the public hearing for comment if there's any. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, what you have uh, before you tonight is consideration of proposed amendments to two provisions of Title IX land development regulations regarding the prohibition of the citrus grinning and Caribbean fruit fly host plants. What I've handed to you tonight is sort of an updated memorandum. I'll, I'll go over what the two provisions are, and I'll explain why I had to do an updated memorandum. Uh, that's going to be slightly different than the backup that you received a few days ago. The first change that we're looking to do is uh, is regarding uh, Section 913076D24, which is basically in the plat portion of the um, of the code. And, and this section of the code uh, requires certain notices to appear on final plats. These notices act as uh, regulations going forward. Uh, for whatever's been uh, platted, usually subdivisions. This notice is going to state, property owners are prohibited from planting any Caribbean fruit fly and citrus greening host plants as specified hereon and are required to remove the same if any exist. Catley guava, common guava, loquat, rose apple, Suriname cherry, orange jasmine, and Chinese box of orange. We've, we have always required a notice similar to this that listed the uh, Caribbean fruit fly host plants. Uh, technically, it is actually not in our code. It is found uh, in, in selected provisions of the comprehensive land use plan, so we're taking this opportunity to go ahead and okay. actually incorporate it into the code um, and adding the two uh, citrus um, 
greening uh, host plants to the list. Let me uh, ask you, which document will take precedent? Well, the uh, land use or the title, the title this land? This is actually going to reflect, uh, for, the, for the most part, what the comp plan states, except for the fact that the comp plan doesn't reflect the two uh, citrus uh, greening plants. And we are going to, uh, through the EAR process, we're going to go ahead and, and, and add the citrus greening plants in the comp plan. So you're going to have it in two documents, though. Which is usually what you want. You want the comp plan to sort of set forth the guidelines, and you want the code to implement what the How do you know if you change one that you change the other, though? I, I've, I've done this a thousand times, too, and there needs to be some mechanism to make sure that one is connected to the other. Well, and that's sort of the problem. Uh, technically, they're probably, uh, we should probably have incorporated the uh, citrus uh, fruit fly uh, prohibition into the code. It's not there. Language is in the comp plan. This is sort of going to correct the fact that it's not there now. Uh, we're adding the uh, language for the uh, for the uh, citrus graining, and when we go through the EAR process, we'll go ahead and add that language. Into the Ho comp plan. Hopefully, then, what you're saying is this will bring them together so there won't be a conflict, because Craig's right. If we forget one or the other, you, you, you tend to have a problem. I've done that dance before with the city, and the it's really mixed up legally. You get, it's a nightmare. No, exactly. And so that's we are going to make sure that they mirror each other. And, and I think uh, what I've been, uh, what I've seen so far, ever since this has come up, as far as at least the citrus greening, uh, applicants have been very willing to uh, add this notice onto the plats. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just, not, I'm just a technicality of. No, it's and you're correct. It, it needs to, the comp plan is the constitution for growth management, and, and the code needs to reflect that. And if anything, comp plan is going to trump. The comp plan is a trump. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and but we will go ahead and add the uh, citrus greening uh, language into the comp plan during the EAR process. Great, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's, no, it's, 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 no. It's, it's no, you're absolutely correct. George, I have a question. This is only on new subdivision plats. Is that correct? That is correct. Is there any way to get this on uh, a single family? Yeah, I remember that company? dance with the greening. We. <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 George and I have had a lot of talk, conversation about this. The dilemma is not so much the prevention of planting. We even talked about preventing selling the, pro, the plants in the county. Um, the, the hoops get bigger, and so it's like anything. We, we'll take the first swipe of the pie that we can and get it done, and then maybe back into the other. But it's the removal of plants from existing homes and, home, and subdivisions becomes a very... Well, no, I was thinking something like, uh, you know, when somebody comes in for a building permit right. to that, stamp it. That right. might be a... Right. Yeah. If I could just comment on that. Um, two things. The, the proposal addresses final plants and then any, any type of development that requires landscaping. And, and these type of species aren't the kind that we're, we would see. You know, we have the two tree requirement with, um, with single family homes, but we don't review, we don't have a landscape plan that gets down to shrubs and that sort of thing okay. for single family homes. So we, we, won't, we wouldn't have a way to address that. Um, one other point that George has made, uh, both the attorney's office and planning staff since the Board of County Commissioners directed these changes, we've asked people to, you know, whenever we've seen them on landscape plans, to, to remove them. They've been added to plat notes. So far, we've had 100% voluntary compliance out there, so we don't anticipate any problems. And the only other thing is when we do get to the comp plan policy, we probably want to make sure that that's fairly general and not get into species uh, yeah. or some other diseases that could crop up and we need to take some quicker action, but we need to have a policy that, that sets the groundwork for that. Well, but we do need to get the species in the LDR, so it's good to, to spell out all the specifics we can with this. But we may have to – there may be something else and there may be some other host plants that we find out about later, and we'll, we need to, to, uh, to just be able to act quickly on that if it happens. That's all I had. Is that it, George? Yeah, well, that's the uh, first regulation. Uh, we're proposing a second regulation, which, uh, and this is where it's going to be different from your previous backup. Uh, we're going to add a list of prohibited plantings uh, from any required landscape areas. Originally, this was going to be put in Section 926.06. Uh, after we've, uh, revisiting the issue very recently, it's been discussed that it probably better put in 926.05 under general requirements. Uh, for landscaping, and the idea is to create subsection 6, which is just going to go ahead and, and for anyone that's got to have a required buffer or landscape, uh, it's going to, these, the, the plants are going to be added to that list as, as prohibited plantings. So that way we can cover um, uh, areas other than platted subdivisions. Very good. Did uh, 
Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, did you come to con a conclusion about the banning of the sale by nurseries? Yes, that's a, that, that was something that uh, the Board of County Commissioners directed the legal uh, county legal department to evaluate. Uh, Florida statutes uh, is pretty clear on the subject that uh, the, the regulation of uh, nurseries and the sale of plants are to be preempted to the state. By the state. Yeah. They, they looked at it, and the county actually worked very hard at trying to do something. But um, in all candor, the state is a trump card. Yep. And, and, we're, and we're working with the state, and we anticipate by the end of the year, the 1st of January, that we may have that um, as an item already. So they just don't want to give up authority right. on The dilemma for everybody on greening is that it's a, the psyllid is a small bug, and the, these plants just harbor the, the, um, the, them and, and throughout their lifetime. And it's, it's not like in canker where you remove a plant and then it doesn't spread. Greening is these psyllids flying, so they could be anywhere in the county. It's not like... Being near citrus or near agriculture matters. I mean, it's unfortunately we really need all of them gone because it harbors the psyllid, which is what when it bites the plant, it spreads the bacteria to another plant. You don't know about it, so you know it's it's a tough life, and we appreciate everybody's support. Yeah, what what has been the response from um, the busy bee places like that? Have you received any any responses for from those groups? I. We haven't gotten any negative response taking it off a of landscape lists. Uh, I mean, very rarely. I, I think there. I think there would be a concern if they couldn't. If, if they still have stock, <laughs> have it in stock, and and want to sell it to, uh, you know, to homeowners. I don't know, George, if you spoke to anybody in the plant. No, I, I haven't. When when uh, we found that the state preempted all regulation of nurseries, we did not contact any nurseries. He still about. has his hair. He probably, if he was if he was scalped, you'd have known he'd been out to talk to anybody about removing something for sale. In commerce, you know, right? we understand that. It's okay. We appreciate what we what you all are doing. I do have one point. Okay, uh, George, you, you had said this was going to go into nine two six point oh five, but it, it states nine two six point. I'm sorry, it was going to go into nine two six point oh six. Okay, um, that's in the original backup, and, and instead uh, we're going to go ahead and put in nine point two six oh five. But your the stuff you just gave us says nine. Two six zero six. Yeah. For anybody who says something. Oh, thanks. For anybody who wanted to have someone come out and identify the plants in the yard, who would who would we call to do that? The extension. Uh, the extension, extension service. Yeah. Okay. Because I think a lot of They're people would try to be I'm, of help. They're pretty well known, I'm, I think. So. All right, is there any other questions of uh, our attorney or of anybody in the staff? If not, we'll uh, public hearing. Is anybody in the audience care to be heard? Here, seeing none, public hearing is closed. Uh, gentlemen, I'll pleasure. make a motion to approve. And it's going in 05. It is. It, the, the old provision said that it was going to go under Section 92606, Landscape Material Standards, Sub 4, Shrubs and Hedges. The new language says it's going to go in 926.05. Uh, we're going to create Sub 6, Prohibited Plantings. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion. To I'll second. A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Like sign? Okay, great. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Citrus industry can make another month. Mm -hmm. Heck. <laughs> uh, second item is uh, consideration of proposed amendments on the to the exact evac excavation of mining regulations LDR Chapter 934 mines and agri agricultural areas. Brian. Thank you. This is a see. This is a proposal to amend Chapter 934, and actually, this is being done at the request of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And essentially what this will do is codify what have recently uh, become standards of approval for sand mines that are located in agricultural areas. And after uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission requested staff to pursue this amendment, uh, the staff took it to the Board of County Commissioners on July 24th, and the board did uh, direct staff to initiate the formal process. And essentially the intent of these changes to the land development regulations are to provide the same level of protections for adjacent ranchette residential type uses that are already provided to 
residentially zoned uses, and these would be for properties that are adjacent to mining operations. The first of these changes has to do with the landscape buffers that would be provided around a mining project site, and this would be wherever a mining project site abuts an agriculturally zoned parcel of 10 acres or less, which would be uh, it's your typical ranchette size parcel. And essentially it puts in the same protection regarding a type A buffer requirement that's already required for when a mining project abuts a residential zoning district. The second of the changes is similar in that it applies a standard which already applies for mining sites adjacent to residential zoning areas that would essentially this would now be applied to mining sites that are adjacent to ranchette residential or agricultural zoned areas and this limits the activity on the mining site to set from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays and additionally there is a limitation that there be no off-site hauling after 5 p.m. And then the last two proposed amendments have to do with essentially the maintenance of unpaved roads that may be used as part of a mine's haul route. And the first one adds that essentially it adds the failure to maintain the unpaved hauling route per the approved plan as a reason for pulling a mine's compliance bond. There's a list of reasons already in Chapter 934. This adds that as a reason that a bond could, compliance bond could be pulled. And then the other change has to do with the amount that is charged for a road maintenance bond for a mining project, and that increases the road maintenance bond amount from $2,000 per mile to $10,000 per mile. Staff's recommendation to the Planning and Zoning Commission is to recommend that the Board of County Commissioners adopt the proposed LDR amendments. Thank you. Anybody got questions of the staff? Yes. Did I hear a yes? Yes. Great. Go ahead. Surprise. Um, we have the 7 to 6 p.m. on weekdays, which uh, <clears throat> through the back door says no operation during weekends. Is that what we're... Right. That is that the intent? Yes, and that would be only for mining projects that abut either a residential zoning district or um, agricultural parcels. Yeah, I understand. I just wanted to make, make sure it was clear to me that that also included nothing on the weekends. Thank you. George. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'd like to ask uh, Jim Davis a question, if I could, through Bob. Uh, I, Jim, come on up. And this, I know, uh, I do know I had a call that there's going to be another sand mine in an area where there are already a couple out on 82nd. There's going to be an application soon, I believe. Uh, Jim, when you have you have standards for um, a non-paved road, such as let's just do as 82nd, and it's got a sub-base base, and the materials are set, and standards are set. I assume by anticipated traffic in an area such as that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We, we have standards for unpaved roads, basically an 8-inch stabilized uh, sub-base or base. And that's usually adequate for everyday traffic. But once a mining operation is introduced into the area and the frequency of heavy axle trucks uh, use that road, uh, particularly in the rainy season or in times of the year when the moisture content is either too low or too high, then the roads deteriorate quickly, even if it is up to county standards. So if you get a large, a couple of three large mining activities and you have a lot, have a lot of uh, truck traffic in the wet season, then the inspector goes out and checks that road. There's no... There's no increased types of materials that are used to maintain that road during that period of time. So the inspector goes out and determines whether the road is in acceptable shape, and then the person or the company that's involved in the sand mining has to maintain that standard that's in this new requirement and reg. Yeah, that's correct. But if you have two or three mines operating in the same area and they're all using the same road, many times we end up in a finger-pointing a situation whereby we have to get all the mining operators together and try to develop 
some maintenance routine that, that it's equitable for all three of them. And that's where lately we've kind of gotten into some awkward positions, really. So the, the permit could be pulled from any one of the three or four or whatever, whatever number of companies that are working a single road. The permit could be call, pulled if they're not maintaining in the, the road to the level that's acceptable by your standards. Yes. It's not a person call, calling in and saying, look, I've gone down that road every day and it's a uh, washboard and I can't get through there five mile an hour. That's not the issue. It's the standard and the maintenance of the standards and the inspection that's done by the county. Well, yes, but the two usually are, the two usually coincide such that when we do get complaints, we do respond. And, uh, you know, we try to make sure the road is in an, an acceptable condition, which re would require more frequent maintenance or adding material that, that's good material <coughs> much more frequently than the normal road that's not on a haul route. I think, I mean, uh, Greg, are you asking if there's a, a standard rather than an emotional Move to to fix the road. I mean, there is a. That, I assume they have a standard. You yeah. got it. And that our new our rule says they've got to meet that standard. I think his dilemma is going to be if we have two or three mines when they get into finger pointing, how how you divide that up and you know hopefully eighty second will get paved pretty quick. And we won't have that problem. But. Well, didn't that fall under the code enforcement agency? I mean, the agency that activates that. You get a report in, code enforcement goes look at it, or do you code actually Code enforcement do that usually calls us, and we respond. Okay. And we, you know, we get involved in the mining permit condition, which either, you know, requires the mine, mining operator to maintain the haul route, or if they don't, we can pull this bond that's being increased. So you have the authority to pull the issue, not the code enforcement? I think the dilemma is sorting it out. There, yeah, that's. And I don't know what they're going to do about that. That's why they get paid so much. Well, is that, Jim, isn't that based on the number of trips? If not, uh, Group A is going 50 times a day and Group B is going 30 times a day, that's basically you've got a ratio there for maintenance based on some, on trips? What you would think. Or weight? Uh, both. You know, the, the type of truck makes a difference, the frequency makes a difference. Uh, and it's difficult, you know. We we don't have someone there 24 hours a day, counting every truck, looking at labels. You know, many of these mining operators uh, they contract the trucking out to various entities. So we could have, you know, two or three man opera mines operating, but five or six trucking companies operating. So it it gets. To be an interesting. If you uh, hold three compliance agreements in your hand and you say we're going to take all we'll these at on. one time, guess yeah. what? I imagine they'll find a way to fix that road. <laughs> yeah. Real clear. And that happened just yesterday. Uh, like Solomon yeah. cutting the baby, you know, they'll do right. something. Uh -huh. Where did that happen? That happened yesterday on 82nd Avenue. Okay. And now you're going to have another one on 82nd. So there's a proposal request yeah. for another one there. And the road, the paving, uh, we're talking a a long time before the paving is going to occur. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's years off. It's been rumored Six for a while. Six or eight, ten years. Yeah. Any, yeah, other right. any other comments? I'm sorry, Bob. I, I was just going to say, regarding the paving at 82nd Avenue, that's a project that's on the MPO's priority list to use federal funds in doing that. And we're right now finishing up the second of four phases that get a road construction constructed. The, the federal government paid for the PD&E, which is the Project Development and Environmental Study that was done a couple of years ago. Design is almost complete, but then we have to hope that right-of-way and construction phases get funded expeditiously. I'd say it's probably going to be about 10 years before it's... It's still the MPO's fault. It's really... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a 13-year cycle from when it gets on the list, I think, isn't it, Bob? Something like that. Yeah. That's best case That's if best money's case available scenario. and yeah. money's not available these days. Um, any other comments yeah. about the reg? Excuse okay. me. Um, Brian, um, what are the hours of operation when uh, a mine is not next to one of these properties that, that this LDR... <laughs> Uh, addresses. Well, well, there are no limitations for a mining project site that's not adjacent to a residential zone or, or ranchette parcels as is proposed. 
the Planning and Zoning Commission does have the ability to put limits on the hours of operation as part of the administrative permit approval that each right. mining site has to obtain. Do, the, is there any, does anybody up here feel that we should do that? They, we, we do that a lot, but part of the reason these rules came back up is these are the, these are the hot points that seem to come up on almost every sand mine, so it kind of codifies them ahead of time. The key on the, sec on the third part, or the second part, on the 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. operation had more to do with the employees being active on the job site. The, the neighborhood complaints usually relate around, re revolve yeah. around truck traffic, which has been limited at 5 o'clock. So 7 to 6 is a little deceiving. It's really 7 to 5. Um, and you do still have, it's an administrative permit, so you can still you can massage can come up. But this at least tells everybody ahead of time these are the minimums. If we need more, we, we can deal with it later. But it's, I think that in the long run, this looks to me like what we have attached to many sand mines. Okay. Okay. I think the I think it's good rig. I, I think the problem that we're we're going to find in the future is that the sand mines are located usually they're isolated, pretty well isolated. They're not really near that many ranches or homes. No, but in, in some cases. You know, you've got a lot of homes at near Road 60. You've got a lot of homes and major development on 69th, places like that. And those trucks have to go by those places also. So you've got an ex enormous extension of the damage that can occur to the road because you, you've got the sand mines pretty close, mm -hmm. but they've got to go a long way to get on that paved road. And you're going to get close because of the lake effect and lots being sold around a new lake. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I um, mean, uh, typically a sand mine is put in because eventually they're going to turn it into some kind of residential development, and the, and the mine is going to be used as, as an amenity. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, that's, it's, I mean, it's a, tra a trade-off. But this is a good. I think mean, personally, I think this is a good base. So. Yeah. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. If not, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody out there want to speak? Hearing none, I close the public hearing. I need a motion. Move to adopt as as presented. I'll second it. Craig Fletcher and Bob. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Passes unanimously. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Bob. Get, have you done my two little near and dearest to my heart things tonight? <laughs> okay, Commissioner Matters, does anybody have anything they wish to speak about? Yeah, I have uh, an issue. I, uh, I asked uh, Mr. Keating to, uh, to make a copy of a, a letter or a uh, a document, I guess, that was presented at the uh, St. John River Water Management District on September 11th by one of the commissioners, Ann Moore, and she was addressing some of the issues that are occurring between the uh, Corrigan and the St. John's Land Exchange. And I thought she did a real nice job in, in bringing up some of the issues that affect the community. And if you've got that on, she she had four points, but I think the point three and point four are really the ones that I wanted everybody sort of to, to uh, be aware of. And she br brings up the the problem I think with that was occurring in this particular deal is that there was very little input from the local community. Uh, you understand it was not. You understand it was not bought for conservation purposes by St. John's. Was, we, the county, changed it to conservation land on our own without their permission it, or request. It was bought with preservation 2000 funds, which are conservation funds. Actually, in addition to that, uh, the statute for statutes 373 say any lands purchased uh, prior to uh, July 1st, 1999, is presumed to be held in conservation. So, uh, so under a state statute. Uh, uh, 373 and uh, state statute, uh, I think it's 253 dealing with P2000. It's, it's deemed to have been purchased for conservation purposes. And she brings out the uh, point that uh, once, if they decide to uh, exchange the land to a, a private developer, that uh, the local government really doesn't have any opportunity to step in and, and uh, purchase the uh, land itself, and this this particular piece, uh, the Sand Lakes piece, was was on the LAC list to be purchased, and I think there was anticipation by the county at that time that we would be sharing in it, in the purchase of it, 
So I, I just thought that I think this affected Indian River County pretty strongly, and maybe we could ad advise or make a suggestions to the county commission that they could write to the, our representatives and also to the governor to uh, not necessarily be involved in this case because I know they're filing an appeal. But in the future, there ought to be some way of recognizing the needs of the, of the local government. I mean, we, we're here on the Planning and Zoning Commission, and uh, we're, we're sort of planning on how the development's going to occur in our county. And certain areas do get designated as conservation. And then to have a higher power or without really any exchange of information between the state and the county, it, it's, I see where it would be difficult to predict in the future what, what's going to be happening. And so I think there needs to be some mechanism uh, for uh, solving this particular problem. So I'd like to make a, a recommendation at some point that we suggest to the, uh, or make a motion to the, that the county commission address this issue by uh, asking our representatives and the governor to um, see if they could get the, get this changed some way so that there would be some, some mechanism for uh, the county to have some input if conservation lands are going to be uh, exchanged to a uh, private developer or a private entity. The only, thing, only comment I would have with that is I would agree with what, what uh, uh, Dr. Baker says, but in my only thing that has always bothered me about this and the timing is that provided the owner of the land has agreed in writing to the change in zoning, and in this case that did not happen. The owner of the land was St. John's Water Management District. We changed it to conservation land. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to fight this fight tonight because I believe in conservation rights. I believe in conservation land. I really do. But there are a lot of things that this county could do with development rights, et cetera, to help move this down the road as one package. And I think that's a, it's a broader picture than what we tend to focus on right now. But the fact is, is that land, it's not a problem. If this county has changed land to conservation land and the owner has agreed and wanted it to be conservation land, I am 100 percent behind Dr. Baker. But if we do it and take it away from somebody and make it conservation land and they didn't agree, then I think you, that fight should be fought then. St. John's didn't take that issue. They let it happen, and that was fine. But the fact is, is they'd had that land in their mind for a long time for another use. But I think if you go back to what George uh, Glenn just said, uh, that it was it was by default conservation land. And see, I, it's when St. John's tells me that, I'll agree with you. Well, the state is saying that. The, the St. John's has conceded that, uh, as Dr. Baker pointed out, the county's appeal under decision uh, to the uh, governor and cabinet sitting in their position as the Florida Land and Water Adjudicatory Commission. Uh, they've conceded that the land has been purchased for conservation purposes uh, as been dictated by uh, four statutes, both uh, 373. I guess arguably they said they used it for that because they used it in a swap that gained three times or two times or four times the amount of conservation land out of it. So it's in the governor's hands, and if you all want to make a motion tonight, it's fine. But I, it's the, the, it's a, this is a sensitive issue with me only because of the fact, the background of it, and I'm not trying to oppose conservation land at all. I am for it 100 percent. Richard, would you like to uh, make a motion? Go ahead. I thought I did. Okay. Can you restate your motion? Uh, I'm sorry, Bob. Actually, that's what I was going to do, try to clarify Dr. Baker's motion. As I understand it, it's it's really pretty limited that you you are making a motion that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners ask our legislative delegation to initiate legislation at the state level to require the uh, water management district or other entity that owns conservation land to give the local government first right of refusal to purchase it in in the in a case that they're surplusing it or looking at trading it or in some other way disposing of property. Is yeah, that that's correct? True. That's correct. Very okay. well stated. Thank you. Do I have a second on that? I'll second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, discussion. Greg, so Greg. 
I had, you know, in the fact, fact case, something like that, and now that it's been better explained probably and I wasn't listening clear, I don't, I don't have a problem with that at all. The St. Board of Management Districts can be asked to give the county first right of refusal on anything. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other commissioner matters? County has to be uh, planning matters. Can I comment? Can I go ahead and sure. comment, Bo? Um, <clears throat> this is hindsight, of course, but I still want to say something about it. In this, uh, in what we just talked about, in the St. John's making this trade and paying for property, etc. Uh, and I tried to stay very uh, up on it as far as reading was concerned and listening to people that were commenting on it. And the thing that I don't understand from the St. John's point of view is that they are making this trade, in essence, property for property, and then they're going to pay for additional. Had they explained why they thought the property that they were getting was so valuable as far as water use was concerned, and biologically, I think it would have gone a long way in making it more platable people. But I fail to understand um, or have ever read that caused me to understand the reason for the amounts of land involved and the positions of the property involved and how it came to be that valuable for the St. John's. That's what I would like to have known, and I think that would really help pe people in understanding what the their issue was at least. Richard, you're pretty close to this. Do you have an explanation for that? Well, I don't think they, the rationale for, for it kind of evolved, I would say. Yeah. And when they first came down and presented it to the LAC committee, I think Mr. Christensen wasn't, was quite surprised that we were concerned about the issue. And he really didn't go into the justification, though the committee was, I think, pretty strong uh, opposed to it. And when he came down to the county board of county commissioners and spoke, he he had a, another little, exp, a different sort of explanation for it. And, uh, and then it's, it's kind of evolved after that. They discovered that there was some scrub lands there, and so then they made a, a third change in the in the exchange. They put a conservation value on part of it, but that was sort of again after they had uh, proposed the deal to the LAC. So um, I think they were trying to justify the, the trade, and they're trying to not indicate that it was the lawsuit that was driving it so much. But when it first came out, it was the lawsuit was the reason they were doing this. Yeah. Well, that's amazing to me because, I, just, you know, I don't, I don't mean to throw taxpayers' money around. That's not what I mean. But when somebody threatens with a lawsuit, you know, both sides have attorneys, and I don't understand how the threat of a lawsuit can have that much weight. It depends on whether you're elected or not. <laughs> <laughs> See, then you get into politics. Okay, any other commissioner matters? Planning matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two, two quick matters. One, I already reported to you all at the last meeting, just as a reminder, there was an appeal filed by uh, Bob Adair on behalf of the, the Research Center for the St. Augustine preliminary plant approval that, that you all approved with conditions, and that is scheduled for October 2nd, the next um, board meeting. Uh, so, so you may be, may be reading about that. There was a bit of time between the appeal and, and putting it on the board, uh, and Mr. Adair agreed to that. We wanted to try to give a few weeks to see if if the developer and Mr. Adair could get together uh, and work out some kind of buffering. You, you might recall there was, there was a bit of that attempt during the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, but uh, that apparently has not borne any fruit, so the, the appeal is going forward uh, on October 2nd. And the other, just kind of, a, just kind of an observation, I, I think these microphones are, are a little tricky to use, but what, what we've been advised is you're supposed to be about 18 inches to 12 inches away that from far? it. Okay. And so it's kind of difficult to know what you sound like, so it's, it's, it's a lot of times people are getting up into it and getting garbled, so I just want to just ask you to maybe 
Maybe met, play with it a little bit, you know, Thank see you. if uh, <laughs> see, see how it works. But uh, I think 12 to 18 inches is what's been recommended. You can tell how old somebody is by how close they get to the mic. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. <laughs> It works for me when the telephone, you know, long distance, the louder I get, I'm sure it works better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next item is attorney's matters. Do you have anything, George? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm hoping this is about 12 to 18 inches. Um, Sir, sort of going back to the uh, St. Augustine plat approval process, a, uh, uh, I brought up a provision in the code uh, 913.07.4H2, which uh, relates to the review of uh, preliminary plats. And uh, I noted that the provision stated that the approving body may attach conditions to the application which relate to Indian River County land development regulations and affect the project the, the project will have on the community and are necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the county. Um, subsequently, I, I came back with a memorandum explaining that, that uh, the exercise of that provision is, is somewhat suspect, that uh, the Supreme Court has stated that um, a uh, local government agency may deny a plat application only if the agency demonstrates that the applicant failed to meet objective legal requirements for approval. I, I was requested at the previous meeting to do some more research uh, into this, and I submitted a, basically the same memorandum I had before, but I included additional court language uh, phrases that I thought might help uh, clarify the issue. And I think uh, what we see is the, the courts are pretty clear that it's got to be objective criteria. Uh, you can't have uh, um, just blanket discretion to add conditions on at the last second. It, the approval. You don't have to tell Donna to that yourself on your own. This you're is on, a perfect you're on your own on this ground. This is a perfect opportunity to, uh, to say it now while uh, Donna's gone, and then, and then we won't have to bring it up again. Uh, but anyway, so I, I, the memorandum it, it just includes some additional language. Um, that I've, I've gone from different court cases that speak to the issue. And I, I think it sort of clarifies that when going through the uh, plat process, we really need to look to uh, clearly stated regulations, uh, objective uh, regulations, uh, and improving or denying the plat application. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, question on that, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Uh, the question I had when I had this before was, do you think we need to remove the statement where it says protect the health, welfare, and safety of the Indian River County residents. Do you think we need to remove that or reword it or? Well, my understanding of the, it might, that, that's a good question. Is uh, it too vague? It, 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 well, it's vague, but from my understanding from where it might become useful is in the um, uh, PD uh, process. Right. PD process where it requires an applicant to follow both the uh, um, Plat rules and the site plan rules, and and there's more of a horse trade uh, in that. And much so more subjective, right? It's much more subjective, and so that this type of language might be uh, applicable for a, a PD uh, coming forward. Uh, but that's something we can look into. There, I'm sure our code and uh, any code out there, even the uh, Florida statutes, have provisions that probably are uh, not constitutional and and. Well, I've seen this health, welfare, and safety, health, safety, and welfare of, of residents on every document in the entire since I was can remember. You know, that's the prime directive of all officials, elected or otherwise, is to protect the health. So I don't see how we can get rid of it, but it is subjective. I understand. Well, and, and usually, that that type of language is associated with the a power of a legislative function to pass legislative uh, actions. And, and the problem, though, is when you're looking at the approval of a plat or site plan, you're getting into quasi judicial. It's non-legislative. Exactly. And so that language is typically used to justify legislative action. Very subjective. Of very at this broad. level, it's very subjective. It'd be uh, left over to the county commission. I, exactly. That would be the legislative act. Ex exactly. Okay. And it will, you know, and like, but we've had a couple of legislative actions tonight that you voted on, so, you know, that would be applicable to those situations as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anything else? We're adjourned.